Hi everyone, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're meeting on today. For me, I'm actually live here from one of my favourite places, which is the headquarters of the Office for Women in Sport and Recreation on Wurundjeri land of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders, uh, past, present and emerging, and to any Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people that may be uh, participating in today's webinar. For everyone else, would love to hear where you're um, tuning in from, so feel free just to put that in the chat for us. And I'd officially like to welcome all of us um, and to all of you to the Office for Women in Sport and Recreation's third edition of the Change Our Game conversation series. It's time for change. We need more women in sports leadership, definitely. My name is Sarah Lowe and I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Softball Australia and I'll be facilitating today's session. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, today's webinar will be recorded and will be made available after this particular event. So if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them in the chat uh, at any time during today's webinar and or to give us a little bit of encouragement as we go along. So we'll be checking those uh, throughout the session. We also have two of our wonderful Auslan interpreters here today. Uh, if you want to all welcome Kate and Angela, uh, and they'll also be live captioned uh, as well. So if you just give us a bit of a wave, say hello. Thank you. Uh, the Change Our Game um, initiative for the Office for Women in Sport and Recreation aims at level the playing field for women and girls in sport. As part of this initiative, uh, the Change Our Game Ambassador Program was launched to create greater visibility for all women and girls in sport and recreation. And in 2023, eight inspiring women were actually chosen to promote the Change Our Game movement as ambassadors and to also shine light on issues that are important to them. So it is with um, absolute honour for me to invite uh, my three very special guests who are ambassadors for the Office of Women in Sport. Uh, I'll start firstly with uh, Jakara Egan, who is a proud Muthi Muthi Gunichmara woman and also assistant coach at the Western Jets for the AFL Coates Talent League. Um, Jakara is also a mental health social worker working as the National Manager for the First Nations Healing and Wellbeing at Headspace. Um, Jakara, welcome. And to Melina, my old friend, Melina Astana, we've known each other for so long. She is the founder of women of uh, the Multicultural Women in Sport. Melina is also the current chair of Gymnastics Victoria and serves on numerous sports um, and advisory committees, including Table Tennis Victoria, the AFL Southeast Commission, and I know she's been doing a mountain of work with the Australian Sports Commission lately as well. So welcome, Melina. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and my old friend, Rana um, Hussain, who I know for, uh, I know you've only been in the industry for 10 years, but I feel like I've pretty much known you for that period of time. So she's also worked in the sports sector, uh, like I said, for more than 10 years as an inclusion and diversity expert. Uh, respected media commentator, Rana has recently founded her own organisation, uh, The Good Human, which is a happy uh, coming together of Rana's passion, uh, working with leaders and workspaces to drive cultural um, cultures of belonging and inclusion and I love that you've got that in your backdrop as well Rana so that's great great plug for the good human we love it always <laughs> um, well, playing, Sarah. Absolutely. absolutely you've got to give these <laughs> plugs <laughs> welcome I'm really excited this is the third conversation series so now we know um, that women continue to be up underrepresented um, in visible leadership roles in sport and recreation sector so this includes more um, executive leadership roles in leadership board positions, high performance coaching and officiating in media roles. There's also been some like recent data from the Australian Clearinghouse for sports that while this data shows high participation at the grassroots level, other data suggests that, um, that women are still not transitioning through the pathway to professional or high performance roles. So while various reasons have been suggested as to why, it seems a series of social, cultural and sometimes procedural barriers still remain. So in today's session, we're going to explore these themes today. So again, I'm really excited. So we, get, uh, we may just get started. So lots of questions for our panellists. Um, maybe we'll start for everyone. We'll, we'll start with the same question and we'll just go around uh, the screen. So uh, what do you believe are the primary barriers preventing more women from entering leadership roles in sport and how can these barriers um, be overcome? Maybe I'll start with you, Melina. You're to the right of my screen. Sure. Thanks, uh, Sarah. And uh, we were the only two people of diverse background in AFL in any leadership position for a long time. <laughs> Hopefully that's uh, not the case anymore. Time. 
So we know the reasons. We will kind of discuss this at length. Uh, I'll give it in like three words, male pale still. I mean, that really is one of the reasons. So it's really a boys club, bring on your mates, the culture of your men drinking, violence on and off the field. Uh, those who are in the system are driven out because of these environments. Um, for example, at an awards night that I was at, uh, these the men on the table with me were discussing the length of the women's skirt and the fact that one of them couldn't stop looking at them. So also at board meetings, when I've had them on Zoom, I've had men sitting with a glass of you know beer on a Monday night, which is, you know, these are the kind of environments women have to be at in, in sports leadership. So how many are going to stay back, stay on? And so for, for women of color, it's even harder. We face the double glass glass ceiling, as I call it. We have to work really hard. Um, we are overlooked for leadership positions. When we aspire for them, we are told we are spreading ourselves too thin. Whereas if the same was done by an Anglo woman, she would be considered a go-getter. I am in leadership positions, as you mentioned, but I'm constantly spoken over, um, considered a troublemaker for having a different view. I love that title, by the way. <laughs> we also have uh, Anglo women guarding their spaces. So they have worked hard to get there and there are only few seats on the table. So if they make way for us, they may be displaced themselves. Same for us. We get other women, you know, coming in of diverse background. We're very protective of our spaces. So we also become part of the problem. And there's also unconscious bias where people prefer to work with like-minded people and have certain preconceived notions of others. For those who do get to leadership positions, despite that, pressure exists to conform to gender leadership stereotypes. So that's also a difficulty. I would suggest some of the things very quickly is, you know, having more role models shining the spotlight like like these seminars are, like the Office of, uh, for Women in Sport and Recreation is doing. I think that's really important. Mentoring, professional development and networking, very, very important uh, for women. Um, quotas and targets, I've always harped on about them. They're important. That's why we've been able to achieve 40% women on most of the sports boards now because of the quotas that we have for them in Victoria. Uh, workplaces need to have inclusive policies, including for recruitment, retention, and promotion, including paid parental leave. We've just adopted one at Table Tennis Victoria, which we are very proud. Um, safe spaces need to be provided for women to report inappropriate behaviors. There also needs to be under, uh, organizational understanding uh, to develop, uh, needs to be developed on cultural diversity and gender barriers created by inappropriate actions in the workplace and call these behaviors out. Um, diversity, in, equity, and inclusion needs to be built into strategy. I don't think it should be a separate strand where you know, some people are kind of looking at it. It should be in every aspect of whatever's done by his sport. And then more women on the board table, we need more of them. And in mainstream roles, not just in you know DNI and community kind of roles, we need them everywhere. We need them in every leadership position possible on and off the field. So some suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, that's wonderful, Melinda. And we're all, Jakara and Rana and I are all, you know, nodding our head as you're saying all that. And, uh, yeah, you've definitely got all that experience to to share with us. So thank you. Um, Jakara, maybe? Yeah, I love that, Melina. Mic drop straight up. Yeah. I, Absolutely. I Boom. Like, <laughs> how do you follow that? But um, I, I do want to acknowledge yeah, a couple of points, I guess, that you make and, and some of the work that I've been um, really uh, grateful to be part of over 2023 and now we're, we're seeing the that consultation and co-design and development come to fruition in 2024 but um, I think today was it today Rani you, you could probably fact check me on this Ash Gardner being made um, female cricketer of and maybe I have this title wrong but one of the cricketers of the year which is amazing yeah. talking about role models and visibility and she's one of three First Nations people to ever represent across men's and women's, um, the, our country, Australia, um, in the sport of cricket, which is phenomenal in this day and age, really. It's a bit mind-blowing, but I think Scott Boland and Dizzy Gillespie were the only other two. So the Belinda Clark Award, thank you very much, and apologies to Belinda Clark. It was an amazing. Yeah, award. but she also won Cricketer of the Year from the ICC from the women's side as well. So Beautiful. And that speaks, to, and I mean, that really, you know, anecdotally touches on, on the problem around um, one of the barriers being visibility, but... As I mentioned before, being privileged to be part of the um, Women in High Performance Coaching Project that's been happening over the last probably 18 months. Um, one of 250 plus women who have been involved in that project, shout out to Michelle de Hyden and, and her team at the Australian Sports Commission doing an absolute phenomenal job. The, the recommendations, I'm looking at my notes here, sorry. What are we doing? We're fixing the leaky pipeline. Um, and some of the drivers of poor participation in, in the coaching from a coaching perspective, but I don't think you have to 
look too far to look at similar drivers um, in poor participation in other sectors and in industries and other parts of sport. Um, exactly what Melina touched on, bad behaviours and toxic cultures, organisational barriers and outdated work structures, um, substandard and inconsistent recruitment structures and, and lack of coordinated development opportunities. So, you know, take a read it is available to have a read and as as we work through and and look at more questions we can unpack and have a look at some of those things but again anecdotally as a woman in sport I think that very top one the bad behaviors and the toxic culture I think that one is um one of the biggest things and something that we hear most commonly from women um is that coming up against those things with lack of support from an organisation can really lead to not only poor participation on the field, in community and elite spaces, but that transfer across into off-field roles, whether it be coaching, administration or um, uh, referees and officials. Mm, definitely, Takara, just those culturally safe and appropriate workplaces are all really important. Uh, how about you, Rana? What are, what are your thoughts on this? Look, I don't think there's much I can add in terms of the barriers that exist and I think everybody on this call would already know them. I think we all experience them all the time. I guess I just, you know, would reiterate um, that conversation around if we want more women um, in leadership positions, we also have to speak to more women and all kinds of women and I just don't think we do um, and that part of that a big part of that is rethinking the way the system works which is really hard it's the hard stuff but that's actually how we're going to change this and shift this because otherwise we're still operating in a a power structure that promotes certain people over others um and so we're just actually not going to get the change like there's not that many jobs <laughs> in reality at the top um, and if we really want to actually make changes at that top level we actually have to rethink the processes and the way we do things um, and so I know we're going to get into that so I, I might leave it there. <laughs> Thanks Rana. Uh, Melina I may uh, put this one back to you. Um, how does having more women in sports leadership and roles positively impact the actual sports industry from a business and cultural perspective and I know you touched a little bit on this but if you could expand on that. Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so sport was inherently, I think, designed for men and continues to be so. And then people complain that women are not good at the sport or don't play at the same level. How can you expect women to play a sport designed for men in sportswear and gear, again, designed for men and for a male audience? We do it, though, and we do it well, but something needs to change. We need a change of formats, of uniforms, shoes, equipment, for men, women to play with modest clothing, hijabs, etc. All this needs to happen. And as women, we know what other women want and can design sport for them if we are in leadership positions. For example, I've, um, I, uh, I sit on the AFL Southeast Commission. I've looked at a number of constitutions of the clubs. They don't even have anything about female sport. They just tack in one paragraph about something and expect that the whole system is going to change and, and that they're going to work for all these women who are coming to sport. It's just ridiculous that you have all these men designing it for, for women, women and women of color. <laughs> And then when sport is designed in a way that caters to the other half of the population, that is uh, that it wasn't catering of till now, it, it will also impact the business, business of sport positively. We all know that there's been studies done on that. It also creates a wider fan base as well, because we have those in leadership positions who know what it takes to attract women. It also brings uh, diversity of thought, brings innovation. And the culture of an organization really depends on the leadership. I think female leadership tends to be compassionate, considerate, and conscientious, three Cs as I'd call it. Considering we have had to work extra hard to get there to these leadership positions, we tend to work equally hard to make a difference and be valued. Um, I also believe that female leadership is more inclusive. We bring along others so that it has a catalyst effect on creating greater diversity. Usually when I'm sort of interviewing for positions or anything else, I make sure that we interviewing another, um, you know, other women or women of color or people of color as well. Um, it also makes other, others comfortable in coming into those leadership positions when they see others like themselves, it provides role models as others have spoken about in this panel as well. And it encourages others to aspire for those positions. And this eventually brings about a shift in the gender balance and the culture of an organization. So I think it really has a positive impact on both business-wise and culture-wise. 
Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Thanks, Melina. Um, Jakara, how can sports organisations create more inclusive and supportive environments for women to thrive in these leadership positions? Because this is where we need them, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think um, that's quite multifaceted, isn't it? The answer, a lot of different layers to it. I think um, being privileged enough. Oh, sorry, Jakara. Sorry, apologies. Um, we've, we've just lost our Auslan interpreter, oh, no. Jakara. Uh, sorry, Angela. If we, oh, no, sorry, Kate, apologies, no. my fault. Go oh, on, Jakara, good. keep going. No. Um, sorry, sorry. So, uh, yeah, being part of um, the Diversity Inclusion Sport Alliance panel last week, you know, I spoke and I will always speak to the importance and the power of the individual. We can have, you know, all the structures and the recommendations and the processes in the world, but often, as we know it and see it now, women often achieve and, and gender diverse um, people within our clubs and associations office, often achieve higher status or um, higher roles in leadership once they're sponsored and once they have champions and often that's a male so generationally um that's what people like myself and and yourselves you know have probably experienced um and it really comes those those recommendations and those structures and things really only work when we can do our self work and have the courage to hold the mirror up and and really assess our biases. There's 30 plus years, I think, of research around unconscious bias and especially around athletes having an unconscious bias towards women um, and men being more closely associated with sports in coaching and, and athletes and, and things like that. So, um, again, referring back to, to the women in, in High Performance Coaching Project, we, we talked about um, and Michelle's team talked about, you know, having to address those behaviours and cultures. And that very much starts with your individuals in the organisation um, and being able to connect and, and assess and, I guess, audit where you're at and, and looking at, and I said, someone mentioned in the chat, what does, what does success look like? Success looks very differently. And our, and our athletes, I've said this before, I think, on, on one of these series, our athletes are a different generation and they're demanding much more of us. And they're demanding us to be more holistic and, and, and understand that success is far more than premierships um, or flags or whatever that looks like in traditionally in your sport. Um, so to assess the behaviour and the culture of a workplace takes a lot of inner work. Um, we need those systems. You know, we've talked about the system supporting diversity. Um, we need to create those safe spaces. We need strategies. And of course, we need those vi that visibility and that storytelling. So I had a great experience um, when I started my amateur football career. Um, before I, you know, briefly for a hot minute played in the VFL. <laughs> um, for, for More one enough to come. <laughs> But I was really attracted to the club and, and shout out to Aberfeldy. I think they did Aberfeldy Football Club in the EDFL here in Nam. But I think something that attracted me to their club, this was nearly three or four, year, four or five years ago maybe, um, they were living these things, these recommendations that we're talking about now. So um, they were seeking, they had a women's board for their women's team and program. Um, Alison Crabb, who was the president at the time, was a huge champion for other women's and promote other women and promoting other women into leadership um, positions. Um, and they also had uh, to make that happen really good champions within the club from men who, who allowed those structures to be built, the governance structures that then filtered down into coaching structures that filtered down into more women coming um, and gender diverse peoples to come and participate at that club. So there's all these fantastic examples of clubs that are doing really awesome work at community level. Um, <clears throat> but it's really kind of ad hoc at the moment. So hopefully um, projects like the, the Fixing the Leaky Pipeline, um, looking at even the participation and high performance strategies that the ASC have put out and looking at, well, really engagement starts at community, but we know there's that intersection between elite level sport as well. I think there's something like 10% of the top 36 um, funded high-performance uh, high sport are led by women. So we need visibility here and we need to be teaching the generation coming up through that we're capable of building good structures and spaces for you um, and we need to be introducing them to these ideas that absolutely women are coaches, absolutely women are leaders of your club um, and they're going to grow through and, and really push that change as we fight at the other end as well. So that top-down, top bottom-up kind of approach happening simultaneously. Mm. Yeah, couldn't agree with you more, Jakara. It really takes that leadership of organisations to, 
to do that and showcase and celebrate. Um, maybe, Rana, just kind of going on from that theme from Chikara, just in your opinion, what, what can the role of that mentorship and networking play in facilitating a, a, the advancement of women in sports leadership and how can these opportunities be more enhanced? Yeah, look, mentorship sort of makes me cringe a little bit because we know that women are over mentored um and so it just it sort of depends what you mean by that I like to think about sponsorship um and we know that sponsorship is sort of what actually does move the dial so um when we talk about sponsor sponsorship we're talking about active intentional effort to help someone progress in their career um you know putting someone's name forward you know doing that work of helping them move through um I was reading before of something from Gallup um about you know the the phrase it takes a village to raise a child well it takes an organization to actually develop a leader and you think about uh particularly men who over the course of their career get so much support and advice and advancement um throughout their career and progress forward because other people are lifting them up and so what does that look like for women and often we see even now with um, a lot of consciousness around this women receive the kind of mentoring where they're told to be more confident um, where they're told to you know it's more about their personality, their appearance, their personal characteristics. They're not mentored around skills or they're not supported around skill sets. Um, you know, how many women sit down and get kind of, if they haven't got the financial now, get that kind of support from the leaders above them to upskill in those ways, in the skill sets that they actually need to do the jobs um, and to move ahead. Um, so I think that's what it kind of takes. We, we I would love to see much more kind of organised sponsorship programs um, and particularly ones that look at the more marginalised women amongst us or people amongst us, as I'm really conscious that we're using quite binary language, um, that it looks at marginalised uh, people in an organisation and gives them that sponsorship, real sponsorship, where even when you're not in the room, you're being spoken about and put forward um, and championed in real ways. Um, and there are specific programs that you can look into. There are organisations that do that, but you can also develop your own as an organisation. Um, and it takes that deliberate consciousness, I think. And when that's done well, it's really powerful. And it's the actual thing that changes things up. You know, we talk about this topic a lot, um, but it's that intentional action that really makes a difference. And I know there was a um, comment in the chat, uh, Sarah Gilman talking about you know, the fact that, yes, some of our processes are set up to discriminate um, really when we unpack them and to be exclusionary. And I think things like active sponsorship do break that down, um, but so do, you know, blind hiring mechanisms. And I think it's really easy for people to want answers right now in this um, Zoom panel. And I think one thing I do get frustrated by with sport um, in particular is that we want the answers quickly, we want it um, free and we don't want to do the work for it. And I guess that's half the problem, that actually this work is strategic and needs to be and needs to be kind of put front and centre if we want to actually make the changes. So often when I'm brought into an organisation, I'm asking the leadership, well, do you actually want to do this work? <laughs> Because it's work. It's going to be a piece of work that you have to do and I'm going to help you with it. But if you don't want to do it, then let's not let's not just tinker on the mm -hmm. sides of it. And I see that happen so often. So for people on the call wondering, okay, so what are the tips? You're not going to get them today, but you're going to bring someone like me in or Jakar in or Melina in to then help you think through how you actually want to do it because you actually decide that you want to do it. Mm -hmm. Really good point, Rana. And have you uh, had come across any good organisations or anyone doing this type of sponsorship? Yeah, I think sponsorship is few and far between in the sports sector, but I am seeing it more and more. Um, and obviously there are programs like the Australian Sports Commission's Women in Leadership Program, which is less a um, mentoring or sponsorship program, but certainly a network builder. And I think the camaraderie and relationships that are 
been built between women from those programs have really paid dividends and I see women lifting each other up. Um, Again, I would just kind of warn to the fact that we don't also want to replicate the same boys club network within women as well and and groups of women. Um, We actually want to keep challenging that system and, and those Think that kind of thinking that says, well, I'm just going to hire the person I know or I'm just going to make the easy choice. Um, so I think we run the risk ourselves, even as women in sport champions and advocates of playing that game too. And, and mm-hmm. you know, my big fear is that the, women, the women's sport movement will end up in that space yet again and be exclusionary all over again. So um I think there's a lot of mentoring. I, I'm sass on mentoring because mentoring can create a power imbalance too. Um, that's well-meaning, but um, can often end up in, you know, getting lots of advice, but not real any real action. And what we need is action. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, we just got to make sure that that mentoring is, yeah, it's got that, that purpose and, you know, that shared knowledge as well. It's not just one way. It's about the mentee and the mentor as well. So, no, really good points, um, Rana. Uh, I may flip over to Melina now. Just, Melina, do you believe that there's a need for specific policies or, or quotas to ensure greater diversity in sports leadership and what challenges might be associated with um, implementing these types of measures? Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm a lawyer, so I do believe in processes and constitutions and board strategies. I think we do need to reform those, our processes, our constitutions, our board strategies, our recruitment policies, bullying, harassment, and sexual and child abuse policies, and also have quotas and targets. Uh, We need to create safe spaces for women so they're not afraid of reporting these inappropriate behaviors or outcomes that exclude them. And also we need effective implementation of these policies. All of us have spoken about the good things that can be done, but if they're not really being done, if there's no system and, you know, the system doesn't allow for it to happen, then it really isn't going to. Um, For diverse women, it is even more difficult. So our policies also need to take an intersectional approach. Um, So I I, I don't know if any of you have heard of the Rooney Rule, which is um, emanated out of, um, you know, I think rugby in the US, which is every time there's a position that's very open, you interview at least one person of a BAME background, which is black ethnic minority, background so at least it and there's no obligation for you to employ them but at least you interview one so it opens up a wider pool of people and then it also kind of you know more people sort of feel um confident enough to apply so i think that i've been trying to practice that here in every time i'm looking at something i'm like we have to interview one person of a diverse background whatever you know other other background with an, an intersectional approach so i think that's a good one to follow um, the challenges may be in convincing the leadership, uh, which still consists of older white men. A lot of them, I don't know how many of them are listening in today and whether they will listen to the recording. Um, a lot of them believe that just having policies in place is enough, but the environment and culture doesn't need to change. If that was the case, you would have probably seen more women in leadership positions in sport by now, but that's not true. So we need concerted action by all decision makers, including by each one of us, government, sporting bodies and organizations. And that's when quotas and targets also become really important, which is what we're doing in Victoria. And I'm really proud of the fact that we've been doing that on sporting organizations that I'm part of. Um, The other difficulty is that positive discrimination is often challenged as something that further segregates people. So I've always refuted that argument, particularly in the multicultural space, um, when I advocate for women to play with hijabs, longer clothing, having women-only spaces with women and bias coaches. I've, uh, and I've been told, well, why are you why are you doing that? You're really kind of creating, you, you are sort of working against your own cause. But I don't think that's true because if you don't do that, there's no way that you will be able to bring them within the fold of the club or the sport. You have to think about ways in which you can do have positive discrimination that leads to, you know, having more in people being more included in, in, as a, in the fabric of the sport. And I think that will in ultimately result in them having more confidence in being part of, you know, mainstream, but you have to get them in somehow. So I think that these are some of the challenges that I've seen, I've, I've kind of personally sort of seen or faced. Um, and, and I think we've got to work, um, work to address these as well so that we can have those policies, procedures in place that um, have more women in leadership positions. Absolutely, Melina, and I think, yeah, in the chat, I think someone was saying that the uh, the Rooney rule was part of uh, the NFL 
strategy as well, which is great. Um, Jakara, may flip over to you as well from here. Just what can clubs and organisations do to encourage young women to pursue careers in sports management and leadership? And I, I find this an interesting question because this is uh, this is going to show my age, but this is my thirty fifth year in the sports management industry, and it was a it's been a very lonely place up until about the last fifteen years. But you know what? What do organisations have to do? Give it. Give some tips out there to everyone listening. Um, yeah, and just on um, Melina's point too, just I, I, you know, I heard a wonderful quote just around quotas and positive um, affirmative action and all that kind of thing. Um, Sister Steph Tisdale, she's a First Nations um, comedian, deadly. Um, I, I was doing a workshop with her once and she said, yeah, those policies may get me through the door, but my talent keeps me on the stage. So I think as a society, we're not ready. Um, and, and this will challenge some people as well. Um, that's why we need the, in, this is how I think about it. It's why we need some of those policies and and those quotas and and, and in place to support diverse communities to um, step into these leadership roles and other roles within spaces that may not may not necessarily be safe for us right now. So um, hopefully we can move towards an eradication of the need for them. Um, but a lot of the times, you know, I just love that it gets us in the door, but our talent will keep us up on the stage. So. Um, and I think that comes back to the question you've just asked me, Sarah, <laughs> gone on a tangent already, is what can clubs do? Well, clubs need to think about um, thinking differently. So, again, some of the unpacking some of those recommendations and something that came out really strongly um, from a lot of the consultation we did, not only with participation strategy and women in high performance strategy, but just anecdotally in, across the sporting world is you know, we need to be doing it differently. We can't stick to traditional sporting norms that we know from community to elite level. And that goes from how do we get young kids to participate? Because we know that if young women participate and participate past young women and gender diverse peoples participate past the age that they are now, which unfortunately huge drop off at 14 years old, 13 or 14 years old, we know that there's a higher chance um, that they will take on opportunities off field as well as they grow and transition throughout the game. Um, we know that uh, it's really um, the way we see coaching and administration in elite spaces is really restrictive to women who are primarily, um, who are the primarily, uh, the, the primary caregivers at the moment of our families. So we need to define and look at and, and something that um, came up through the consultations was things like having a, a talent pool of, of high performance coaches or coaches, even at your community level, that if mum, if one mum or dad or um, carer or family member can't do it one day, you don't have to commit to a whole season. You can get someone to sub in for you. Um, it's not that you're committing to, because we all know community football is a huge commitment. It's huge on your families and, and your, yourself as an individual. So how do we look at those roles and those structures for volunteers, administrators, coaches, and do that differently so it better suits Australian families and 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 um, our diverse families and especially women and gender diverse people who are who take on those caring roles? That was a huge barrier. And then the other barrier was the re-entering of the work or workforce or sports place, um, sports organisation following career disruption, which again, for women is usually after babies, after um, taking a bit of a maternity leave. It could be could be anything else, but women more are more likely to experience a larger career disruption than than men. How do we think about that as a society? How do as a society? How do we think about that as an organisation? How do we create a ramp on and off for those women um, and gender diverse peoples to, to not be lost into the ether once they hit that disruption or be fearful that a disruption is going to stop their passion and their love, their career for sport, whatever part it is in their tracks. So I think there's some really practical things we can do in thinking differently about what sport looks like and how we participate, play and shape um, not only how we as individuals engage, but how competitions look. Um, the emphasis on competitive versus well-being and social participation, all those kinds of things. And 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 as an organisation, you can look at things from from the micro and from individual level to the larger ecosystem as well. 
That's great, Jakara. Um, we, we've got a whole stack of questions coming through in the chats and comments, which is really wonderful, and they're all very supportive. Uh, Rana, I want to just, uh, there are a couple more questions that I had, but I really have learned from the last two that um, because we're getting so many questions, let's try and get to some of the audience ones. But just the last one for you before we do that. Are there specific skills or qualities that women um, bring to sports leadership that may be different to their male counterparts? And just how do organisations leverage this for success? This is kind of a diabolical question to me. I know, that's why I threw it to you. <laughs> Thanks, appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Because I'm not sure that we want to lean into that necessarily. Again, because, A, you know, we're framing this conversation and that and that's perfectly fine, but we're framing the conversation within a very binary understanding of men and women. You know, it's dependent on how we see gender and, and how gender plays out for all of us, how fluid it is. Um, and then if we are going down that path, we're then also assigning a particular type and style of leadership to men and women um, that I'm not necessarily sure is true um, and I don't know how much of that is actually informed by social and cultural norms too about, you know, how it, women are expected to behave versus if they had the freedom to be who they are and wanted to be. So it's such a, <laughs> it's such a hard question to ask, I guess, when we Sorry, talk God. about no, it's okay. I, I love this stuff. I'm happy. I think it's coming more from that traditional male, yeah. you know, in sport. It's probably where it's coming from. You're right. But, I, yeah, so I think the traditional understanding of the kind of quintessentially female or womanhood attributes that we bring to leadership are things like empathy and emotional intelligence, inclusive leadership, intuition and insight, you know, relationship building, inclusive leadership adaptability if you think of all those qualities just outside of gender there's those are amazing qualities that we should all be aspiring to and we want our leaders to espouse so I think I would love to just shift the conversation to how do we make sure that le sports leaders are espousing those qualities and I would love to see more men espousing those qualities as well as women you know and I think that's what I'm interested in is how do we how do we build in and uh, nurture ethical leaders that are inclusive, that are um, have equity in mind? Um, and how do we bring men into this conversation? And how, you know, it, it, I think everybody on this call would love to sit down with the men that they've been kind of doing this dance with and say, well, what's going on? Like, how do we make this happen? How do we shift this? And I think that's where the work is. Um, and so I would love to understand leadership um, in a more kind of holistic way in that regardless of gender um, that we aim for that. And it comes back to that question around success to you know how can we shift the goalposts for leaders as well and what success looks like for them they are under and I you know my experiences in elite sport at NSRS SRF our club um land and boards there is so much pressure to deliver and deliver on numbers um and to sound a certain way and to look a certain way and I would just love to see that culture shift that when we see an empathetic you know, humble leader who can deliver the business side, sure, but is also coming from a really ethical um, and respectful place is celebrated for those attributes. And I would love for that to be from both men and women. Oh, you're on mute, Sarah. We did say it was going to happen to one of us. We had, men we had mentioned this was going to happen and it happened to myself. I was just talking amongst myself. <laughs> uh, really well said, Rana. I was just saying you've got a lot of um, support there in, uh, in in the chat there uh, agreeing with you, which we all do. So thank you for that. Um, we may just go to the, the Q&A and, and Melina, uh, this one is for Rana and Melina from Anonymous. Melina, you, just earlier, right at the start, you touched upon that double glass ceiling for women of colour. Why do you think us women of colour feel the need to fit in all, uh, in all the time in white cultures? What can we do our part to ensure that we can be more confident in all, our authentic self? Um, I actually um, don't ever try to fit in. <laughs> I know I came to this country much later in life, 
And I knew mm -hmm. that I was going to be different to everyone else. And I had to work doubly hard. So when I was referring to the double glazed glass ceiling, it meant we have to do that extra work or be judged more than other people are or constantly prove ourselves. But it doesn't mean that I'm trying to mold myself to be an Anglo person. I am still very different. I'm very aware of the differences that I bring. And I look at them as a positive. I, I feel that I'm successful. And anyone who has, uh, is successful, on even Rana here and anyone else, is because we are very uh, proud of our background, our heritage, our culture, very comfortable with that. Yet we have imbibed some of the good things that come with the Australian way of life or the culture. So it's, I think it's a good combination. It's, it's really good to have that uh, combine those good things about both your, you know, your original culture and the culture that you adopted. And then kind of, and that's the reason that's always one of the things that I've found is what successful people have within them. So I, I usually try not to confirm. I would prefer not to. I, I think I bring the strengths that others can use and we can complement each other with what we have. So I may bring certain things, others may bring certain things and that, that leads to innovation. So I think we've got to be really comfortable in who we are. We don't have to necessarily, we have to fit in, of course, in a workplace. And that's important because you've got to work towards a certain goal. I think believing in working towards a common goal is a different thing, but fitting in for the sake of it, I'm never sort of, um, I've never believed in it, nor have I propagated. So um, I was just referring to to, to the double glazed glass that you know, we face, the barriers that we face, but how we overcome them, it depends on us. Definitely. Um, Jakara and, and Rana, anyone want to jump in on that one? I, I agree, Melina. I, I just want to name the fact, though, that um, it can be it can be quite radical when you do turn up as your full self and in your full culture and identity, um, and that can be scary and you can feel like at times you do just want to blend in or um, you stick out like a sore thumb. Um and so, I, like, I, for, if people are feeling that, like, I just want to name the fact that that it isn't easy to to stand out, to inhabit your um, full identity all the time and in very public ways. Um, and so I think also sometimes we do see people from marginalised backgrounds kind of trying to find those ways to just let themselves off the hook or have that kind of time where they're not feel like they're under a spotlight. I was at the cricket um, last week in Brisbane match day hosting um, and, I, you know, it felt uncomfortable to be me. You know, it wasn't doing anything. I wasn't, you know, talking about leadership or gender equality or race, nothing that I know, none of the stuff that I normally do. I wasn't holding up a mirror to society. I was just there to be delightful on camera and be a professional fan. And yet I felt really visible, really uncomfortable. And I wasn't even bringing my full kind of Muslim Indian Australian. So <laughs> I was doing kind of the bare minimum of that. And so, and I realized just inhabiting that space was quite a radical act. Um, and so, and you don't always have the energy to do that. You don't always have the safety to do that. Um, I, I wasn't always safe in that environment. Um, to just be me, you know, I was copying things from drunk punters. Um, so, you know, like it, I really get where that kind of question is coming from, um, but how important it is when you can and you feel like you can to in, take up space um, and we it's on us, all of us, to create those spaces where people can be fully themselves and make sure that it's safe for them to do so. Yeah, I think, um, so just listening to you there, yeah, it's definitely the environment. And, you know, I want to put a really clear message out, especially for all of the women here today, is that um, we don't have to always be that strong person that holds that cultural load. It can get exhausting. I mean, this is how, in our room here, the four of us have entered this, this world and, you know, especially in this space of sport, you know, the, the, that cultural load can be a lot and it's that uh, that's one aspect and then being, you know, a woman as well. So that's why they call it that double glass ceiling or even triple glass ceiling. I've even heard uh, myself being framed as the bamboo ceiling. So there's, there's a lot of cultural load uh, sometimes, especially when you're, there's not a lot of uh, women in sport leadership. So, yeah, I think it's a really key message out there that it's okay to take a break and not feel like you have to be everything to everyone. Uh, 
have it yourself, Jakar. Oh, and yeah, and just to acknowledge too, like as a um, fair skin Koori, I often refer to myself as an undercover Koori because of my proximity <laughs> to whiteness. <laughs> it can, I can, I'm very aware of what that means in in today's kind of societal and power structures as well, and how much privilege I hold, you know, um, and power comparatively to some of my um, other brothers and sisters who are of darker skin, and um, I very much. Uh, I have experienced, um, you know, so then I start talking and they're like, oh, no, nah, she's, she's mob. <laughs> she's, she thinks like mob. She's different like mob. So um, I, I feel a real, um, not obligation, responsibility, um, especially if I'm in a space like this um, or any space that I'm afforded that privilege to be a part of because um, I make people feel comfortable um, that I create a, a space for my brothers and sisters to enter as well that may not be afforded that same opportunity. So, um, you know, once we, Courtney Eagle said this to me once, you know, once we all, oh, if I shine or if one of us shines, we all shine and it's about keeping each other safe and and bringing each other up. And um, and it's hard because it's 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 something you experience personally, but then you, you see someone's really close to you who does, um, you know, and there's research and evidence and all that kind of stuff that suggests that um, culturally and um, racially um, marginalised and diverse women of colour do do experience that uh, um, that you know the onus on them to on us to perform um, is much higher to to and this and the goalposts shift much further away to achieve similar positions of of leadership or to be at the tables and and all that kind of stuff. So I just very much. Um, you know, am aware of uh, my role um, and that, you know, it's not and my, it's not always safe. Like I've had, and I'm, I'm sure you three have all experienced it, where you have gone in strong, spoken up for what you believe in and trying to create that space and uh, been, and not won that battle. <laughs> and and um, so you don't, not all spaces are safe to show up as your true self. And um, unfortunately, and and it's not a sign of weakness to be able to identify that and be like, you know what, this one's not for me. Um, but also um, it's not just for our communities to be leaning into each other. It's for our deadly allies who need to be aware and stand up and, and start to create those safe spaces too. Well said, Jakara. Sorry, can I right. just like cool. drive that point home because it's such a beautiful point you just made, Jakara. Like I, what I feel like you're talking about there is, is authenticity and and if and to the question about you know feeling like you have to lean into whiteness when you when that's not you i think ultimately like we can make ourselves sick by performing and and not being who we are authentically um and sometimes that looks like tapping out and sometimes that looks like going okay well this isn't a safe space for me to turn up in my full self um but I think the guiding force has to be asking ourselves, well, what is authentic for me and what does that look like? And then um, making the choices. I just wanted to say that your point was so good. You were all so good. <laughs> now there's um, another question here from, from Judy Gal. So thank you, Judy. Uh, how do we navigate group resistance when you are the catalyst for change, um, the backlash? Uh, anyone, feel free to hop in on this one. We all just, that was the sound of us all taking a deep breath in <laughs> before we faced a fair bit of backlash and resistance. A lot. <laughs> Go on, Rana, you want to jump in? Hi. It's such a lonely, lonely place. <laughs> and my experience in sport, because of the way we do things, is you're often one person, you know, with the whole department or you know, like I've often been the one inclusion and diversity practitioner, so I don't really have a team or, um, and so you are, you really feel like you're one person up against a mountain or up against, you know, an entire system. Um, so I just want to name that it, that it is very lonely. Um, uh, it's not a sexy answer, but it's like, <laughs> You have to be strategic. Um, you have to build your relationships. 
um, and find your allies and keep Kate Jenkins once said this because I asked her a very similar question in terms of like when things don't work and comprom- having to compromise and she sort of said have the big picture and you kind of try you go down one route and then if that's not working you back up and try another avenue if that's not working you back up but keep the goal in mind and the big picture in mind and you just keep trying different avenues so I think um understanding that it is a permeable wall even when sometimes it feels like it's a brick wall and there's always a way through um, but it's just that persistence and it is strategy and it is relationships that's sort of what I've learned I don't know Melina and Jakara yeah yeah I totally agree with you Rana I've entered spaces where I've been looked at as why is she even here she's a person of color she didn't grow up in this country she doesn't know anything about this board and she's going to be on, you know, in a leadership position with us. You've got to really build that trust. And and there's ways of resistance as well. There's peaceful resistance. There's, um, uh, you know, proving through your expertise. And there's sometimes you need to be st- take a st- uh, strong, firm stand. So I think you have to judge your, your space and you have to judge whether you're going to be safe there. Um, I have... I have, uh, you know, unwittingly or may knowingly actually have gone into spaces that I knew are not going to be safe for me. And I have, but I've done it for the next generation because if I wasn't doing it, there's no one on that table that's going to do it. And so I have certain times taken on that on, but I also understand that a lot of people and, and others have spoken about this, Rana and Jakara, it's not safe all the time to do that. It's not that load is too much. So and not everyone has that kind of, you know, necessarily you know, wants that wants to do that either. So it's good, it's it's okay to step back at that point of time and say, well, this is not for me. And it's it's getting to be too much. I need a break. And you are in I was in a toxic environment at a workplace um in my legal industry. And I I suffered a nervous breakdown and I had to literally I started suffering from anxiety. I had to take that time off and decided I'm going to leave this toxic workplace and move to another one because it's just not the place for me. And you've got to do that at times because you can't keep fighting that fight, uh, even though it's 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 going to be good for everyone in the end, but sometimes it's not good for you. So I think that's it's really important to acknowledge acknowledge that that that's that may happen and that you've got to yeah th- there's ways in of doing things. And if you still realize that it's not going to happen, then please walk away from that toxic environment. Thanks, Melina. Look, we're uh, we're coming to the uh, the end of the session. We've got eight minutes, and I really just want to acknowledge everyone. That there is a there's a there's a good question. I don't want to want to take the last one about ageism, but um, if anyone wants to touch that one, we've probably got about um, maybe a minute to to have that one. That's in the chat there. Uh, what's some ageism is in sports administration? Can anyone comment? I mean, I can comment. I'm probably the oldest person here. <laughs> no, anyone want to jump in? Because there's lots of people on the chat as well. No, I want to hear what you you would say to that, Sarah. Uh, well, I, I'm, I feel like I'm a little bit lucky. I've got a little bit of a baby face. I am turning 54 this month. So I'm about, and I've been in the industry for 35 years. So I'm not quite sure who asked that particular question. But, um, yeah, I think it's definitely, um, you know, it's it's a bit of an issue. I think as, as as people get older, you know, it's it's hard to stay in any type of industry. But I think at the moment in sport in particular, volunteerism is definitely declining and you know I think there's many ways to contribute whatever age you are and I think especially with young people I'd highly encourage them as they enter into the industry to be you know put your hand up to volunteer and and then that just goes to the other gamut at the end of your career as well I think it's um, age is just a number and I have to say that because I'm getting older but um, I think everyone's got something to contribute towards that. And I think add yeah. add that to the uh, add to that the fact that uh, some uh, some people take you know maternity leave and and take time to take care of their kids and come back into the workforce. Obviously, they're going to be older at that point of time, and they are discriminated against for jobs. I've heard that even for athletes, it's really hard for them to get back into the athletic career post a child and things. So I think that's combined with you know all these perceptions about women, you know, having had a child and then you know growing older, you just you're not supposed to be doing your be able to do your job as well as anybody everybody else can, but that's just absolutely not not right. So we have people in retirement ages should be pushed out now. I feel anyways because people have their working life has gone up 
to you know, we can work very well up to 70, 75. So, um, so I think yeah, ageism is a problem in every profession. Um, mm. but sport definitely yes, because I think we have this perception of athletes always being younger people, and you know, so then it tends to translate into you know, even everyone who's surrounded in the who is part of the sports ecosystem, they've got to be young and able body, you know, not able, you know, whatever, you know, agile and everything. So it's it's just that perception thing as well. And I think yeah, it's just very all part of the same conversation really in that we just <laughs> we really prioritize uh and champion certain types of people and I think good leaders and organizations are constantly scanning their landscape for pockets of power and um where power kind of um is funneled and where it's withheld and who kind of gets a say and who doesn't and who gets a um, leg up or a hand up. And so I think that's that's the game, you know, being vigilant about that. And, you know, we've talked about it a lot today probably because of our lived experience in terms of race um, and, and gender, but it's not about those kind of bucket, traditional buckets that we think about all the time. It's also about just who has um, access and who doesn't, how do we level up those playing fields all the time and what's it like for people who might be feeling marginalised and that's not necessarily the person that comes to mind in the usual ways. It could be all kinds of people, you know, people live rurally, um, whoever it is, age, um, we have to as leaders really constantly be unpacking that in our organizations and getting that feedback from every corner of our organization so that then we can mitigate those things it's funny enough i just want to add very quickly that for men as they get older they seem to get more and more leadership positions and women don't so it doesn't quite work for men the same way as it does for women in terms of ageism so yeah disappointing mm. and melina you know I wish we didn't only have three minutes left. We, I feel like I'd rather um, Jakari have been on this before, but I've never seen so much chatter going on in this chat group. I really apologise to everyone. This happens all the time. But um, thank you, everyone, so much. And I do probably want to do a bit of a, a shout-out. There's, um, you know, we've got people from all around the country <laughs> and uh, Kia Ora to, to our friends in New Zealand, quite a few dialing in from there. Thank you for the happy birthday wishes. It's on the 16th. I would appreciate better if you actually message me on that day. I love my birthday. It's only 15 more days. Uh, and someone else is turning 73 and they've been here a long time. So, yeah, really wonderful. And thank you, everyone, for the, ch uh, the chat. Uh, thank you to our incredible ambassadors for sharing the expertise and the insights. And of course, like Rana said, the lived experience. We're, we're so appreciative. Uh, like I said, we could talk for hours on end. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. I hope you enjoyed it. I feel like all the uh, all the feedback there and, and comments just uh, give us that, that encouragement that you've enjoyed the conversation as well. Let's keep these conversations going in our communities because this is what truly makes the change. Uh, let's, you know, I know it's really hard to speak up at times and especially with people with lived experience, it's not always comfortable, but it is changing. It is 100% changing. And it is our people and our supporters of the Office of Women in Sport in recreation and, of course, change our game, uh, make those opportunities exist for women of, um, uh, of, of all backgrounds. So uh, you can keep up to date with our Change Your Game. Uh, we're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We have a website. And uh, I think Lani's already put, oh, there you go. It's all on the screen for me already. Uh, there'll also be an evaluation survey. It'd be really great to keep that chatter going and, and to give us that. Uh, and also, if you're interested uh, in attending the Change Again International Women's Day lunch, I'm going to speak quickly. It's Friday, the March 8th. Come and join us. I'll be there. Come out and look for me and look out for the ambassadors. We'll all be there having lunch. It's at Town Hall from 12 p.m. And my wonderful, lovely person, I know Div Play, a diversity expert and advocate, you really have got to join us. Sarah Stiles, uh, the director, um, she'll be there. And thank you to all the team. Thank you, Lani. Um, thank you um, to our Osman interpreters, Kate and Angela. I'm not even sure if you've cut me off. Have you guys cut me off yet? Are we at the time? No, I've got 30 seconds. Um, so there's, oh, great, great offer, 10. Definitely get a seat of 10. There's not many um, tables left, I understand. They're, they're going really, really quickly. So please get those tables, get one seat. It's all right. You'll be amongst friends. 
Uh, if you came last year, it was such a wonderful event. So please register. I'd love to see you. Come and say hello to all of us.